Hey everybody, today Rado talks through episode 35 of the podcast. The, what is it, the penultimate? Is that the next to the last episode of the podcast? I don't know, maybe. Of course, uh, this one and number 36 will end the third year doing the podcast. Will there be a fourth? I'm sorry folks, we just don't know yet. I'm actually recording this from inside uh, the place we're staying in the UK, our former house. We've begun our move back to the States, and at this point, Jen and I, well, it's, uh, you know, the outcome is uncertain if we were to check the crystal ball on how Rado runs through and Rado talks through is going to evolve in the future. But for now, it looks like we got at least one more normal episode with some games of interest, a couple of top tens to revisit, and then a fair number, but actually, I'll be honest, kind of a small collection of questions that have come in at questions at rotto.com. So we might get out of here in record time. I don't know. But folks, uh, find out. Uh, hang on. We'll be right back. Okie dokie. Well, let's start out with some new games of interest I have discovered while trawling through the back alleys, the dark underbelly, the RSS feed of Board Game Geek. There's some expansion, there's some new games, there's some reprints, there's something for everybody. Starting with Agricola, the Bubblecus deck, which, I don't know, it's 120 new cards. And apparently it's for the revised edition, so I don't know if they're going to be backwards compatible with the original edition, which is what I've got. And I have to admit, I didn't even know what a bubble kiss was. I think I did a search for it, and it was some kind of heron or crane, some kind of big bird. But then somebody else pointed out that in the original Latin, apparently it is also a phrase having to do with farming equipment of some type. What was it? Let me look up here again. Oh, it's a herdsman, ox driver, plowman, or a rustic, which is a bubble from the Latin. So there'll be some new rustic cards, not surprisingly. What are they? I don't know. I don't care. It's Agricola. Always love to have more. So that's the Agricola Bubblecus deck. And then after that, we've got Carson City, the card game, which is very, very interesting to me. From designer Javier Georges, who is one of the designers of the original Carson City, which is a fantastic kind of communal city building worker placement style game that Jen and I absolutely adore. It's never really been quite perfect for us because in the default mode it has, it does feature a fair bit of direct conflict between players, which you can avoid without feeling like you're undercutting your ability to play efficiently. But still, I mean, I haven't really been 100% on board with the expansions that have come out over the years, but still, the core game of Carson City is so great. And I cannot wait to find how it has been simplified and streamlined down into a game that takes less than an hour and is played with cards. Uh, color me interested. I expect it'll be great. Carson City, the card game. Then we've got... Pandoria. And the reason I'm interested in this is because it's Jeffrey Allers and Bernd Eisenstein together again. These two men gave us Aaliyah Eocta S, still one of the best uh, dice euros ever to have come out. Of course, it got reprinted years later as... Oh, I forgot the name of the Indiana Jonesy type reprint, but regardless... These guys, they're both great designers on their own. In fact, uh, Burn is responsible for one of my top 10 games of all time, Peloponnese. And now they have come together again to give us Pandoria. It is apparently an era of antiquity civilization building game. Not too surprising, considering these guys' pedigree. Don't know much about the gameplay. Don't really care. I expect it's going to be great. But apparently, it is tile-laying as more and more terrain gets explored and conquered, but apparently players are um, combining to the, the same central area and are claiming, I think, connections between the tiles or something like that. So what could potentially happen is when I place a tile, if that creates another tile being 100% surrounded all sides, that's when it activates. And so both of us might have vested interest in a given tile that gets activated based on what I do. Again, uh, you know, the description on Board Game Geek is not 100% clear, but it sounds intriguing. And like I said, these guys have produced wonderful stuff together. So I'm very, very interested in Pandoria. 
Then we move on to, you know, I almost didn't mention this one because it's not really a full expansion. It's just a promo. It's Altiplano Sunny Days, which is going to be a new little mini expansion for Altiplano. Adds, uh, what, three new boats, three new houses, one order, and one mission card. And so there's not very much there. And what more than anything else I'm interested, does this mean Altiplano is going to be getting the same type of upgrade structure that its predecessor, Orleans, did? Because I have to admit, I was never really that keen on the fact that so much of the Orleans expansions were just these little one-off uh, uh, mini promo expansions that you had to track down in all different types of places. I have to admit, I'm much more keen on just come up with a really big expansion, put it all in a box so I can get it all at once instead of tracking everything down. But... Uh, maybe that's not the way Altiplano is going to work out. And so for fans of that game, well, the only way you're going to be able to get this is through a subscription to Spielbox Magazine, which I don't think I've ever talked about on the podcast before. I used to subscribe myself because it's a very, very nice, well-produced magazine. comes out every month and it has available in German and English editions full of really great pictures, really great articles, great reviews. It's a wonderful, wonderful magazine. I Back when I was working full-time in the video game industry, I subscribed, and it was a really great thing to have on the plane while I was waiting for takeoff before you could turn your phone back on. Of course, these days you can keep your phone on during takeoff and landing as well. But um, I used to subscribe because back in the day, I was really obsessed with chasing down every little promo for every game I loved. And so, to be able to be uh, capable of doing that, you had to subscribe monthly to Spielbox, even though it was kind of on the spendy side. But so many great, great promos are only available. Now, if you don't want to subscribe, you can just go onto their website and get individual issues if there's only certain promos you want. But like I said, the magazine itself is such high quality, it's, it's well worth it. I guess this is really an interesting more for Spielbox than it is for... Um, uh, this Altiplano promo. But, like I said, if you want to uh, seek it out uh, because you loved Altiplano, which it's really, really a fantastic upgrade to Orleans, Spielbox Magazine might be something you'd want to look into if you'd never really considered it before. I highly recommend it. But anyway, that's uh, ostensibly about Altiplano Sunny Days. But let's move on now to the next one, Mystic Vale Twilight Garden. Not much to say here except... More Mystic Veil vale goodness. I am so happy to see that AEG continues to put out expansion after expansion. This thing seems to be getting just as much love as Dominion. And for Jensen, my money, it deserves it. The game is more than just a gimmick. And every new expansion that comes out really evolves the game in wonderful new ways. So, yay, Twilight Garden. Cannot wait. But now, let's talk about a reprint. Fae, F-A-E, which is coming from Z-Man Games, and it's a re-implementation of designer Leo Colavini's Clans, which is an older game that it was actually one of the early games Jen and I got. And I should say, Jen loved Clans. I thought it was kind of okay, but I always felt it wasn't really at its best with only two, because at its heart, Clans is a game where you are putting these little huts out on the board and trying to claim more and more territory, but there are huts of different colors representing different clans of, you know, ancient uh, Neolithic humans, which I, I think now it's uh, it's just been rethemed to be some kind of fey, fairy tale universe, but still the same gameplay. And the interesting thing is, while players are putting out these different colored huts, everybody has a secret vested interest in ensuring that one of the clans, one of the colors, does better than all the others. But that's secret. Nobody really knows. So while you're playing, you're trying to not be too terribly obvious about trying to build up the strongest area of control for the clan you like, and also trying to figure out what clan your opponent likes so that you can try to minimize them and cut them off. And like I said, it's, it was a sharp game. Jen, I really liked it. But my problem with it always was... It seemed to be kind of unavoidable. In a two-player game, we would always be able to kind of pretty accurately figure out what the other player was going for, and then it became very tit-for-tat, very chess-like. I've always expected the game would be better with more, with a little bit more chaos, a bit more unpredictability, a little bit more... I'm not really not quite sure what it is you're trying to do there, but I don't mind because you ended up helping me! Ha <laughs> You know, that kind of stuff. I suspect it'll be better with more, but it'll be really interesting to go back and check it out with a new, wonderful, updated, you know, cool art, cool little minis and stuff like that. So I am 
cautiously optimistic, particularly if Leo goes back and revisits the design and maybe updates it a little bit. I don't know how, but I am interested in finding out more about Faye. Then we've got another reprint, Atlantis Rising 2nd Edition. Now, Atlantis Rising is one of the earlier co-op board games to come out. After the big, big success of Pandemic, there were not very many on, you know, available, and Atlantis Rising was one of the first ones. It was really interesting because it was effectively a cooperative worker placement game, which Kind of doesn't make sense because worker placement is all about putting your workers out and trying to grab the right placement before somebody else blocks you off. How does that work cooperatively? Well, Atlantis Rising worked fairly well. It was a pretty well considered, and at the time, and actually, I would even say so, go as far as say, even to this day, a very unique and innovative. Co-op, it doesn't just borrow all the same beats from Pandemic, like probably 80% of the co-ops on the market. And that's very much appreciated. Now, at the time, it wasn't really... Oh, and basically, I should say what everybody's doing. Everybody's cooperatively working together to try to stave off the sinking of Atlantis while we try to get everybody evacuated and um, make cool, super ancient, but super advanced scientific equipment that will help save people and all that while you actually see the island of Atlantis literally sinking in front of you, but with a really cool system of kind of flipping over tiles that represent more and more of the island sinking. So, it was a good game. It wasn't really a keeper for me in Jen because of Jen's whole, I don't like a co-op if it's just constantly escalating and it, there's never any ebb and flow. It's, it's always getting worse and worse and harder and harder and, and more and more dire and more and more impossible and more and more stress-filled. Again, I've talked about this so many times now, the pandemic formula of, hey, things get better, then they get worse, then they get better, then they get worse is so much nicer. Atlantis Rising, the first edition didn't have that. But my understanding is the second edition has revisited the design and might be a little bit more amenable to Jen. So I'm interested in trying that out, but forget about all of that. Here's why I'm more interested. Say it with me, folks. The artist, Vincent Dutre. He does the art. I'm going to be there. So I am very, very interested in Atlantis Rising, second edition. Faux show. But after that, I think we're going to talk about a, another game with a wonderful artist pedigree. Uh, because I just love the art of the Miko or Mihailo uh, Dmitrievsky. I think I say his real name. But anyway, everybody calls him the Miko. And the next game he's going to be bringing his pen to is Plunderous. Now, this is an interesting one. It's one that I normally... Even as much as I would love the Miko's art, I might take a pass on putting it on my games of interest because it is a 4X game, which for those who don't know means it is a civilization building game with a strong focus on the X's R exploration, expansion, exploitation of the world you explore, and extermination of your enemies, i.e. the other players. While I love the idea of civilization, Jen and I hate the idea of trying to tear each other's civilization down. Now, this is a Forex game set in a Pirates of the Caribbean meets steampunk alternate reality. And so, even though I'm not that crazy about the Forex, or more specifically that fourth X, I love the idea of the Miko's art brought into a bright, vibrant Caribbean world full of really cool steampunk uh, imagery. I, I think that has the potential to be absolutely bonkers amazing looking. I wouldn't be surprised if this is one of the most beautiful games of the year. Uh, at least it has the potential to be. And what's even more interesting miniatures, little plastic minis of our ships and stuff like that fashioned after the Miko's art. I think it's going to be the first game that has sculpted minis based on the Miko's art. I'm incredibly intrigued because of that, too. But there's one more reason I'm interested. Uh, I have heard from the designer slash publisher, this game's going to be going on in Kickstarter, and he actually contacted me about maybe covering it, you know, because I often cover Kickstarter games, and I was interested, but I said, I don't think I can do it, man! That fourth X! That fourth X! And he said, well... You know, I thought you were going to say that. And I know a lot of other people are going to say that too. And that is why we have been putting an equal amount of effort and design um, uh, uh, intent towards a cooperative version of the game where you're not trying to exterminate each other. You're trying to exterminate an external force that's trying to destroy all players. And when he started talking to me about the ideas of how they're working that co-op in to... Uh, you know, so basically, imagine a 4X game where um, everybody works together cooperatively. That's kind of a holy grail for me, folks. 
So I'm interested for that. I'm interested for the artwork. I'm interested for the minis. I'm interested for the subject matter. I'm interested up and down the street. I'm sure it'll be a very, very cool and interesting Forex game for players who really want to build up and tear down each other's stuff. That's not why I'm going to show up. I want to know more about this co-op game, and that's why Plunderous has gone from nowhere to being very, very high on my list of games I'm very excited about. I, I've read the I, I've read a, an early version of the rules that just focuses on the competitive, the standard version of play. It sounds like a really good 4X game, dice-driven, all co- but in a, in a smart, cool Euro-style way instead of just you know roll-to-resolve stuff. And he's told me a little bit about their plans for co-op. I am very cautiously optimistic, and I'm sure I'll be learning more in the future about Plunderous. But now let's move on to a game I've actually played. Uh, Way of the Panda from Cool Mini or Not Games. And this is definitely a game with cool minis. It's not an or not. The little warrior, Asian warrior panda minis that come with this game are absolutely adorable and delightful and charming and really cool looking too. Um, But aside from all that, the gameplay is very smart. This is a competitive worker placement game where you are using your workers to do actions that basically is all about expanding your dominion over a board and trying to build up cities and score lots of points. It's not directly confrontational, which is great. I really appreciate that. And um, the the tension that is involved with the worker placement is... It, it's some of the tightest, toughest, most tense worker placement I've played in quite a while. Because it has that... Oh, I'm trying to think of game. Egizia and Steam Time. Worker placement games where once you've placed a worker on the board, that cuts off a significant number of worker placement spots that you would normally be able to do. Oh, uh, Brussels, 1893 is another example where, okay, I want to do all these actions, but as soon as I do this action, 30% of the actions are no longer available to me because they, um, it, it kind of narrows down where I can still place workers. It's a really cool idea. I've seen it work well in many different games. The more workers I place, the less I can do. So the tougher my choices get, and um, Way of the Panda might be the best implementation of it I have seen to date. Jen and I, we've only played it once so far. We really liked it. Uh, We liked it a lot. Although, that said... It is a game where um, you know, it's got this wonderful worker placement uh, system. That it drives the action. The action we're doing, which is just kind of moving characters around the board so we can build buildings and, and um, score points, that second half of the game, in a two-player circumstance, is really not as good as it could be. Um, you know, it, it, we kind of wish the brilliant worker placement was you know, driving some other core system. Either that, or we had at least three to play it with. Because it two, I mean, you can just tell it would be so much better with more. Plus, I have to admit, I wasn't 100% on board with the system for... There's variable in-game and mid-game objectives players can chase after as well that are different every single time you play. Again, they're done very well for higher player counts. I'm not quite convinced that they work as well as they should for two players. Because they're, um, you know... Ah, well, well they're, they're binary. They, you know, One player wins, one player loses. So basically, if there's two of them out, what we found is, oh, well, if you're going to pursue that one, I'm not going to try because I won't beat you. I'll just pursue the other one and you won't be able to beat me. And the game becomes a little bit prescripted, which is a shame. Again, this wouldn't happen with higher player counts. It wouldn't happen if the design had done the objectives in a different way. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think this could be an insanely sharp, fun game for at higher player counts, like for three or four players. At two, it's a li- the jury's still up. But oh my gosh, the presentation is so amazing, and the worker placement is so good. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping to play it a bit more. Uh, Way of the Panda. And eventually we'll get it filmed too. Although I'm not quite sure how that's working too. Because we've done the last bit of user voting for um, the year. And probably in April, we're probably not going to do another round of fundraising. And um, you know, is Rado Run Through Go on the down low for a while? Do I take a break while we're moving? We still don't have answers to these folks. I'm sorry. But in spite of that, publishers still keep sending me games. I mean, heck, maybe that's a reason right there that I have to keep doing the podcast. And for no other reason, so that I can talk about the games that are showing up. I don't know. I, I got to come up with a plan, but uh, not today. Right now, I've just got one more new game of interest to talk about for this month, and it, I saved the best for last. Gloomhaven Forgotten Circles. Oh, yeah. 
new Gloomhaven maps, new Gloomhaven character, new Gloomhaven monsters. 20 new missions, is my understanding. Although the interesting thing is, apparently, they're not just missions that you can jump in into any time. The way some of the... Uh, it's In fact, it's a kind of a sequel. Because apparently, to play the Forgotten Circles, you have to have finish the core storyline of Gloomhaven. Now, Jen and I, we're about 60% of the way through. And we haven't actually had the game out for a while, and we won't because right now it's in a box um, being shipped slow boat to America. So it'll be a few months before we get to play Gloomhaven again. I'm going to go through withdrawals big time. But when we do eventually get to America, and we are reunited at long last with our wonderful painted minis, you better believe I'm going to want to try and finish that storyline so that come Essen 2018, when we pick this up, up, we will be able to uh, see what happens after we rescue, or not, Gloomhaven in Gloomhaven Forgotten Circles. So excited! I just can't hide it! About to lose control, I think I like it. But folks, that's it for new games of interest. Um, and uh, now, if you'd like to hold on, we'll be right back talking about a couple of top 10 topics that were recently covered by me on the show. Hold on, everybody. We'll be right back. Okie dokie. Top 10 revisiting time. And let's see here. The two topics were my top 10 simultaneous action selection games and my top 10 travel games. Let's do the simul act select first. Right. First of all, uh, one thing to discuss is the fact that there, well, there was one person on Board Game Geek who strongly disagreed with my inclusion of dungeon pets on the list. And his argument, I, I think it has some validity, the notion that, well, really, the you're not necessarily simultaneously selecting actions. You're simultaneously selecting several different bids for turn order, uh, which will then subsequently lead into a worker placement uh, game. And we were just bid to see who gets to do their worker placement first. On the surface, I think there's some validity to that, but there's more to it than that, because Dungeon Pets is so brilliant, because it's not just turn order that you're bidding on, it's also that you are programming how you will use those bids. Because uh, the number of imps you put into a bundle or the amount of gold you put into a bundle will allow or disallow certain actions during the worker placement. So um, you know what you're doing in the what I call simultaneous action selection is two things. Secretly bidding for turn order, but also making workers, creating workers that you will be able to deploy in the second half. That is the action because I would so wish to be able to see exactly how all my opponents are constructing their workers that they're going to use in the second half of a phase so that I could be smarter about how I build my workers. So I am going to... I'm comfortable with leaving Dungeon Pets on the list. Sorry, Dustin. I, I think you've got a valid point, but for me, that is action selection. The fact that we are literally, or figuratively, or symbolically, creating, building workers that we will deploy, in addition to bidding on turn order. But in terms of other simultaneous action selection games, I think by far the number one question that I got asked is, what about Tracurian? Tracurian, Tracurian, Tracurian. And I mean, yeah, there's no toys about it. Tracurian is an excellent, excellent example of simultaneous action selection. The only reason it didn't have a shot at making my top 10 list, I'll be honest, it's a, a great shame that I, Jen and I, we played it when I did a run through for it years ago, years ago, when it was on Kickstarter. And even though I've got a final retail copy of it, we have not played it since because it was just so big and so long, and there's just no time to go back and revisit, no matter how much we might have liked a game. So, uh, it only stayed off the list just because I haven't actually played the final version. But I do remember, it's a brilliant example of simultaneously... Another worker placement game where we are, what was it, I believe, simultaneously programming how our workers are going to be able to get deployed around the board, and then everybody reveals at the same time. Very, very similar in that regard to Fresco, which did make my list. So, Tracurian... 
chances are if I had played it, it would have made the list too, or maybe it would have tied with Fresco because they're both kind of similar in that regard. And, and you know, and they and they both have. I mean, I was ranking this not necessarily on you know just how good the games were, but how much excitement and tension came about because of the simultaneous action selection. And actually, it was that metric that left some great simultaneous action selection games off the list, like uh, Jump Drive. I mean, people know Jen, I love Jump Drive, but in all honesty, it might as well not even be simultaneous. There's so little interplay between players and the choices they make. There's a few cards, but very, very few. So um, really, the only reason to do simultaneous action selection there is just to make it play faster, because it's brilliant how fast that game is. So um, you know, there's just no, oh my gosh, what are they going to choose? What are they going to choose? It doesn't matter what they're going to choose. I'm only focusing on what I'm going to choose. Same for uh, Dixit which is a wonderful simultaneous action selection game, but it just doesn't matter what other players are going to be choosing, or at least what, what they are choosing doesn't affect the choices I make for myself. That's what makes simul action select so much fun. Um, but, oh, what else? You know, so, uh, you know, other ones, like La Isla is another great, great game, but the simultaneous action selection is not that big a deal in it. Oh, Fog of Love, though. That's a really great one. That definitely, arguably, deserves to be on the list, too, because the whole game is about, okay, we have to decide at the same time, and I hope I can get in your head and figure out what it is you're going to do so that I made the right choice for both of us. So Fog of Love is a great, great example. Uh, let's see. Ito, maybe. I don't know. Johari. Wait, no. Did Johari make the list? Oh, I don't remember now. It's been a while since I've done this. I, mean, I filmed it, like, two or three months ago. Did I? I think maybe Yohari did make the list. But let's see. Were there any other entries that people called me out? Let me just look through. Yeah, Tricarian over and over and over again. A lot of people said, what about Tricarian? Yeah, no choice about it. It deserves to be on the list. It's my fault. It's, I have failed you, Tricarian. Interestingly, Tricarian's getting an expansion in a few months. It's going to be on Kickstarter. And I just got contacted the other day about, could I actually do coverage for it? And I, my gut actually, yes, I want to, because I'll finally get to play Tricarian again and see the final version, because I know they made several changes based on feedback I gave them for the two-player game and all of that. I'd love to see how that stuff worked out, but I just don't know if I have time, or more importantly, the table space here in England to be able to play it. Let's see here. Uh, no, I think Tricurian was the one that just kept getting brought up more than anything else. How could I possibly snub it? And again, it, it, uh, it's, 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 it's not you, Tricurian, it's me. So anyway, I think, I think that was about all I had to say in addition in revisiting that. Some other really great ones. Oh, 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 no. Actually, one other topic. Several people asked, what about Seven Wonders? Or Notre Dame, or Among the Stars, or Greed, or Oceanos, or Capitals, or or Steampunk Rally. Uh, uh, that is to say, what about drafting games, car drafting? Because those are games where, as a general rule, everybody makes a decision at the same time about what card there or tile or whatever it's going to be that they play from their hand out into the game, and then the remainder of their cards get handed on to the next player. Yes. These are the very definition of, of simultaneous action selection. No two ways about it. None of them, I don't think any of the ones I did made the list because really none of them had the same level of tension that my number 10, K2, had in relation to the simultaneous action. In drafting games, it's, it, it's not uncommon but it's pretty rare, I've found, that I'm like, oh my god, what are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? What are you going to choose? Uh, because, I, I, you know, because I'm going to choose this. You're really focusing more on, right, what am I choosing that's best for myself and what am I trying to eliminate? It's true that in a two-player game, especially, probably of all of them, maybe Notre Dame warrants it the most, because in a two-player game, a drafting game, whatever they choose to play, that's something that's not coming back to me, but everybody else is. <clears throat> and so I guess maybe there is a little bit of tension, but even Notre Dame from designer Stefan Feld, which I think probably is the most tense two-player drafting game on the market, the tension didn't come anywhere close to K2, my number 10, in terms of, oh my god, I'm terrified about what you're going to choose. Uh, in most of these drafting games, I'm interested, and it would inform my decision, but you know, it's just it was that tension that drove me. So that's why none of the really excellent simultaneous action selection drafting games made that list, for people who were wondering. Uh, it's a fair point. I, 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 I totally understand why they might make other people's lists, just didn't make mine. 
Now, the other top 10 I did, and that was a little bit more recently, although in all the moving we've done since, it all it just feels like a, a million years ago, is when Eleni, the cardboard rhino, and I sat down to talk about our top 10 travel games. And I gotta say, once again, thanks so much to Eleni. It was a big task. It was a big ask for her to be able to make it all the way from Malta to Gozo. It was a very stormy day. Uh, it was a rough ride on the ferry. And I mean, she pretty much had to spend the whole day getting out here or getting out to me to film and then just turning right back around and going home. But I'm so glad she did because, I mean, I had wanted to do something with her and time was running out. We were going to leave in just two days after that. If you watch the video, you can see how barren everything was. I mean, what you couldn't see was we were both completely surrounded by a mountain of boxes. In the end, it was 79 boxes, or 78 boxes and an office chair that ended up uh, getting taken away by the moving company. And we were surrounded by all of that, except for a few boxes that Jen was still in the background um, packing up while we were filming. But it was great. I had a fun time with her, and I was especially glad to have her because I knew as I was making my list... I mean, I've wanted to do a top 10 travel list for a long time, but the voters always... D voted it down. And I think that's because for most people, a top 10 travel list is pretty obvious. Just pick a bunch of really tiny games that you can carry easily in a backpack or your luggage or whatever that don't take up much space and that you can play really quickly in a wide variety of circumstances. That, for most people, would be the definition of a travel game and uh, or an ideal travel game. And that was certainly... Uh, Lainey's list was full of wonderful examples of that. Also really great to have her because a lot of her stuff was for more than two. Two. Of course, any list I'm going to make is really just focused on two players. It was great because she's a more social animal than me. She actually has friends that she seeks out and plays games with. Go figure. I knew she would bring a a very welcome grounding to this list because my travel list is ridiculous. And I knew it. I've always known it because back when... Jen and I would travel, and by travel, I mean mostly on holiday vacation travel. This applies to other types of travel too, like you know a cross-country move from one um, home to another maybe, but for the most part, this is really about holidays for, for us. When I was still working full-time in the video game industry, and we would take holidays and we'd spend a week in Cyprus or whatever it might be, um, we would always take games along with us. Because both of us working our full-time jobs, we didn't have as much time as we would like to play games in our day-to-day -day life. So one of the big, uh, wonderful elements of having an extended holiday is finally we can play some games. We can really get some quality game time. But we can also do it in a new, interesting environment. We can travel and see new stuff. Now, in our experience, whenever we go on holiday for more than just a weekend, maybe, when, if it's like a week or more, a week or two... There's always going to be downtime. There's always going to be, you know what? Look, we just don't feel like going out today. Our feet are exhausted. We've seen way too much stuff. We have, we're suffering such museum fatigue. I don't know, have you gotten this? You know, you can only do so many museums in a week before your brain is just too full and you got to stop. And that's always happened to us on any holiday we've ever had that's, like I said, longer than just a couple of quick days. That's why, for us, the ideal holiday travel vacation game is going to be something that we wish we could play back home, but we just never have the time to do it. And that's why my list was full of games that... To vote for them to be travel, it was important that they have a small footprint. Not on the table. I don't care about how big they are on the table. Uh, you know, wherever we're staying, we'll be able to figure out the table. But that they had to compress down so they could fit in our luggage really, really well. That was my number one criteria. My number two criteria was, after that, I don't want quickie little 15-minute games. I want games that are going to be an hour or two hours long to fill in those lazy afternoons. Uh, because, you know, where some people go on holiday just so that they can sit out at the pool and go for a swim, and then read, and then take a nap, and then go for a swim, and then read and take a nap. That is their, you know, that's them, um, oh, what do you call it? Not detoxing, but, you know, just slowing down and, um, you know, resetting their internal clock. Well, we like that too, but rather than sitting down by the pool and reading a book, we'll play a game. And so we were looking for the games that we love playing, but we just don't get to play as much at home because of our jobs. So that's why I had such a ridiculous, non-standard, travel 
um, list. Uh, yes, some of them were on there because there's no two ways about it. I mean, Jen and I, we've done cruises and stuff like that, and it's good to have a few games on hand that are kind of more party-ish, you know, which Eleni's list was fantastic for that kind of stuff. But it's good to have a few more on hand in case you need you're in a social situation and they know you play games like, oh, well, okay, let's bust out code names or what have you, because that'll work out really, really well. But for the most part, the games I chose were for Jen's and my very unique circumstance. And honestly, I would think more hardcore board game geeks would share that, that they would not... But I mean, uh, very few people who've responded to that list have agreed, yeah, what Rado said makes sense. That's how we choose our travel games as well. Nope, I think most people, I was right, did agree with Eleni, and that's totally cool. I totally understand it. But, let's see, were there other games? Let me go back and look. Yeah, I had plenty more games I could have put on this list, uh, including several that I have used successfully in the past. Glory to Rome, that used to be a great go-to travel game for all the reasons I just said, but... Honestly, it's so rare, and it's I, I I want my copy to last forever in case it never gets reprinted. I don't take it with us anymore. I don't want to throw it because it's it's literally the most valuable game I own. So I don't take <laughs> Glory to Rome along anymore, uh, unfortunately. And um, Glenn Moore is a great Glenn Moore. Just barely missed my no no. It did make my list. What am I talking about? Oh, forget about that. Um, let's see here. What else? What else? What else? Oh, um, Rapa Nui. I did think about putting Jaipur on, um, but I'm glad it was on her list. Let's see here. Oh, um, oh, Forbidden Desert. That's a lovely one. Uh, um, as an alternative to, say, Pandemic the Dice Game. Oh, that's a really good travel game, too. B uh, both really, really good stuff. Um, oh, um, but, you know, I should say there are... There were other little games, what people generally consider to be good travel games. If I would have focused more on that kind of list, games that would have made my list definitely would have included Morels, would have included Fjords, probably Agricola, All Creatures Big and Small, Jaipur. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I could have made a list of, of little tiny games that play quicker, but yeah, that, that's it. that wasn't what I was interested in. That's not travel. Oh, I can think of one other game that might make my travel list. I just haven't played enough to be sure. Matt Gert's recent Transatlantic, I think, has the potential to be an amazeballs travel game. Because, uh, yes, it does have boards, but you don't need the boards at all. Once you know the game at all, you could leave the boards at home and just take the cards. And so it's a really... It's, it's like, basically, a travel version of Concordia. Because um, you don't need the map. I, I really thought long and hard about putting. Um, I just, yeah, I just wasn't sure. And I, and, uh, and and the ones I did list, you know, we love so much. Uh, they're really, really fantastic. But anyway, travel games was a very, very interesting topic. Let's see, did anybody have anything else they wanted to say? Oh, I love that one person said Gloomhaven. I, I was seriously considering putting Gloomhaven because I love Gloomhaven so much. I would seriously consider traveling with it if. But it's so heavy, and there's no way to cut that down. But I totally get why somebody would um, tr would travel with Gloomhaven, because I would love to. Because except for the the size of the box and the weight in your in your um, checked baggage, it perfectly fits my yes. I, I would I would love if we traveled via transporter via teleporter. Gloomhaven would be my number one because yay! Finally, we get a chance to sit down on a lazy afternoon in Barcelona or wherever and play through a game in the afternoon. Yes, I'm crazy, but oh, it just makes perfect sense to me. Let's see here. Um, yeah, and I'm looking through the list. I'm looking through the sponsors. Everybody loved having Car or, you know, Eleni on. Yes, she was great. Uh, for people who keep asking, a lot of people ask. She's Greek. She lives in Malta, but she's a native Greek girl. Actually, I believe uh, the travel topic was interesting to her because she might be leaving Malta in a few months as well and heading back to Greece. So, Greek fans of the cardboard rhino, um, you know, uh, you know, let her know that you want to see her come home uh, because she's great. I mean, I've actually played uh, games with her. What did we play? I think I played Agricola with her a million years ago, and you know, she, she's a lot of fun and um, you know, and, and a, a, a really a great hardcore gamer. Um, you know, through and through. So, uh, yeah, let's see. And, yep, and again, it's almost everybody saying, I loved Rhino's list, and Rado's list made no sense whatsoever over and over and over again. Yeah, I understand, folks. I get it. But you know what? The heart wants what the heart wants. So I think that's all there is to say. Does anybody have anything to add on Board Game Geek? Let me just do a quick check there. Let's see here. Ba -ba -ba. Mm. Oh, a few people asked me, hey, why did um, Roll for the Galaxy make it but not Jump Drive? 
Uh, fair enough. Uh, again, it, I mean, a jump drive would certainly make my tiny, super portable, fast playing list. But again, that's not what I'm looking for when I'm traveling. I mean, when I'm traveling, I'm not trying to squeeze a game into every f- spare 15 minutes I've got. If we've got 15 minutes, you know what? Chances are I don't want to play a game. I want to look around and drink in the atmosphere and the ambience of wherever I am. Even if it's at a restaurant waiting for our food to show up, I don't think I'd want to play a restaurant game, which I've talked about in the past. I want to be more in the moment, in the place. It's when I'm going to be sitting down for a few hours with nothing to do that I want a game. And at that point, I don't want a bunch of 15-minute fillers. I want a big, um, you know, crunchy meal. So anyway, that, again, I'm just repeating myself. So... What else? D, D, D. Um, oh, yeah, no, I think that's about it. So, folks, I think that's all we have to say about the top 10 travel games and simultaneous action selection games. So, folks, uh, you've been patient long enough. Hold on, we'll be right back, and Jen and Pups will join us for the Q and the A. Okay, everybody, we're almost to the finish line. Time for the questions, time for the answers, starting with one that was left over from last month. Grady asked two questions, but I only saw one of them. So, Grady, my apologies. You've been very patient. Let me get to your second question, which was pointing out that some of the best episodes of Auto Runs Store were the Brett Spiel Advent Calendar, not because of the calendar, but because of the locations of Malta. Have we ever considered a YouTube travel show? (laughs) Maybe before we leave Malta, we should film some (laughs) iconic locations and do the same in England while you're there. Well, as previously discussed, sorry, Grady, the ship has sailed for the any ongoing Malta travel video type stuff because we are now sitting here in England. Yes, after a week of rain and dreariness, we finally have a sunshiny day. It's lovely. Yes, and we decided to spend that sunshiny day talking to you folks instead of frolicking in the English countryside chasing sun. Well, that's because I'm still... I I have a cold. Yeah, oh my gosh, as soon as... Oh, no, no, that's getting into personal stuff. This is games! Ooh. So anyway, although this isn't really games. But no, I actually when I did that Brett Spiel thing, a lot of people asked the same question at the time. And in all honesty, it's just... It, it's certainly something I could do, but it's... Oh, you know, filling games I can just do from the comfort of my own home. I don't have to get up and go out and do things. So there's like a big barrier of entry there. I think Jen would be more keen on it than me, to be perfectly frank. Yep, I'd even suggested it a while back, and he thought it would be too much work. Yep. So we've not done it. I have very keen too much work sensors. (laughs) Jen is completely too much work deaf. She is completely <laughs> unaware of the amount of work anything will take until she's knee-deep in it and wondering, why did I ever sign up to do this thing? I just try to avoid signing up to do things wherever possible. So that's the state of that, Grady. Sorry. Then Dave wonders if we are planning on a shortened Season 7 for auto runs through with the pending move. Dave says, embrace the move. Put up even Season 7 in April with April through summer being more of a process adventure vlog of move, trimming down collection, etc. Called it Rado Runs Through to the U.S. <laughs> Funny you should mention that, Dave. Please see the earlier mention. <laughs> um, I'm sure Jen can very much appreciate the last thing anybody wants to be doing while they're in the middle of a move is trying to document the thing because you're already under enough stress. Am I right, honey? Yeah. Would you have had a lot of fun filming the packing up? <clears throat> no, and they wouldn't have had fun watching me melt down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, again, uh, I, I, I just, yeah. I, it's a clever idea if we had, but I mean, I don't think either of us have any particular enthusiasm for that. For now, I'm just going to stick to games. And let's see if Richard has any game-related questions. Oh, wait, did Dave have any other one? Nope, nope. All right, so Richard says... While watching the playthrough for Palm Island, I used some ridiculous word to describe how one manipulates the hand of cards. Did I use that phrase in the video game world? And if not, why do I know it? What was the word you used? Palm Island. Ah, I, can, I don't know for a fact, but I can only assume the ridiculous word that Richard is referring to is prestidigitation. Ah, that's definitely a word. 
It, it's not, I, is it that unknown a word? Do, do you know what prestidigitation is? Isn't it the ability to do lots of things with your fingers? Like, you know, move a pin around your fingers and... Yeah, it's, it's basically, I, I think it's literally French for nimble fingers or something like that. Digits and, and presta. Uh, although, strictly speaking, I believe it's officially a term for, you know, sleight of hand magic and whatnot. The, you know, people who do card tricks and make things disappear or prestidigitators. <laughs> uh, but it's just always a term I've used for, uh, you know, I don't know, adroitness with your hands. And I, I think, I think it's broadly, I don't know where I picked it up. I think I've said it my whole life. Probably I picked it up, I'm, I've never decided to be a magician, but, you know, there was a time when I was interested in all that stuff. Maybe I picked it up then. I don't think it's something, it's a term that gets used widely in the video game industry. So yeah, I must have picked it up in relation to its original meaning, having to do with magicians. But yeah, nimble fingers, press to digitation. <laughs> Alrighty, so far, no game specific stuff, but we'll find something here from Ian, because he's got all kinds of questions. Number one, let's see here. I recently bought Spirit Island and absolutely love it. It might be my favorite game of all time. You seem to really like the game, but I note it's one of the very few games on your own list without a rating. How would you rate it? Did both you and Jen enjoy it equally? Well, whenever you see something that I own, that's, you know, at, was it, um, ranked.rado.com or games.rado.com, and it doesn't have a rating, that just means I don't think I've played enough to actually give it a rating yet. And that is certainly the case with Spirit Island, because we played it when I had a prototype of it. The publisher has since sent me a final retail. It only showed up like in the last month or two. And we haven't actually played the final retail copy, so I don't feel like I can rate it. I know I'd probably rate it somewhere in the mid-8s. Ah, man, it's been so long. I think I did that run through like a couple of years ago. Honey, do you remember at all the cooperative game where we were the spirits of an island trying to fend off waves of settlers? You know, and you were like the earth spirit and I was the wind spirit. And, you know, it was, you know, the the island we could move. We, we, we basically, it was kind of an area control game where we moved our little things that indicated... How, how much of our power was centered in the mountains and the rivers and on the beaches and every round the settlers would move in and we were trying to terrify them so that they would all leave? Sounds like a great idea. But you don't remember it all? I don't remember it. Well, there you go, Ian. Apparently it didn't make as strong an impression on Jen. We, I, I can definitely say we enjoyed it a lot at the time. I, you know, I think at the time I was... I'm, I, I, it's it's going to be kind of tricky because I, this was one of the games that I was hoping to play again before we left Malta. Because I think it's a candidate for Game of the Year. Because it is a 2017 game. And it just unfortunately showed up way, way, way late. And so I was hoping in April to do a revisit of, you know, to see if the top 10 had changed any. But Spirit Island was high on my list, as was Anachrony. And I didn't get a chance to get either of those to the table before we left Malta. So I don't know if that means I'm going to do a... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm probably going to put my... Best games of 2017 update, which I normally do in the middle of April. I'm probably going to have to put that off until we get to America because at this point, all those games, well, we have no idea where they are. They're in boxes somewhere between our old flat in Marcelforn and our end uh, goal in Seattle. So, yeah, I, we both liked it a lot. Like I said, I'm pretty confident it'd be a mid eight. I'm trying to remember, maybe it was too long. Did I? Ah, it's been so long. Sorry. Um, but I, I do have every intention of going back to it and probably doing one of those little update videos saying, hey, here's what the final game looked like because before we just had prototypes because I know it has really cool pieces for the settlers and stuff like that too. But anyway, so can't really say much right now. Uh, but I, I, I suspect it's going to be a keeper if we ever get around to actually playing the thing, which of course is a rarity for us. Let's see here. You've said before you have some board games stored in England. Are you transporting them back to the U.S.? as well? Or will you need to sell them? That is true. They are literally in the attic above us as we speak. Ten feet from our very selves at this yes. moment. Yes. Uh -huh. Those poor sad games, which we liked. I mean, they were definitely ones we owned. It's just when we moved to Malta originally, we didn't think we were going to stay for more than a year. We had no idea we were going to end up staying for 
over half a decade there. And we thought, oh, well, I, I can't afford to... We, 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 have, we have almost 100 games. <laughs> that would be insane to move almost 100 games from England to Malta if we're only going to be there. So let's leave 20% of them behind, or 30% of them behind, because we'll be back. And then we never came back. So they're still up there. Well, we came back. We're back. We're back. We're back, games! Although they're still up in the attic because, oh my gosh, folks, that attic is a disaster zone. It's, um, it's full. <laughs> that attic is why we're here in England right now. And it's probably going to take us several weeks to deal with it. I don't know what we're going to do with those games. Um, definitely some of them, I think our tastes have evolved. Uh, you know, because th those were all games. Those were some of the first games I got when we got into the hobby. Like, uh, there's a sizable portion of Battle or Second Edition stuff up there. And at the time, we're like, "Yeah, this Battle or thing is pretty cool. This, you know, running armies and attacking and killing each other." I don't know if we'd have as much patience for Battle or now because our tastes have definitely changed and evolved over the years. So, I think some of them might be trying to find new homes here in Old Blighty, maybe at the UK Games Expo. I mean, that Battle or thing is. Probably, you know, there, there were. I got a lot of expansions for it at the time, and uh, several other games. I mean, I'd love to try Constantinopolis again, and oh, what else is up there? I can't even remember. Oh, 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 the game with the cupcakes and the <laughs> beer steins. Oh, what was it? Nuremberg. Yeah, I'd really like to give that one a try again too. So, looking forward to getting them down, but we just haven't gotten around to it yet. Do you have board games stored in the USA as well, or are they all in Europe? <laughs> We don't have any in the USA. Um, uh, that's oh, not actually, entirely true. Yeah, we have magic stuff. We have a lot of Magic the Gathering. A lot of Fallen Empires. <laughs> if anybody's out there wanting some Fallen Empires, we have a couple cases of it. Um, or maybe not that much. But yeah, we played a lot of Magic back in the day. And when I got into it, I got into it hard. I got a... Uh, a, a license that allowed me to be a retailer, even though I didn't have a store, solely so I could buy them in bulk. And while we ultimately did end up selling most of it to basically make a down payment for our house when we moved to Bend, Oregon, because this was back in the heyday of Magic, uh, you know, we had second and third edition stuff, so we had some very uh, valuable stuff there. But yeah, I also picked up a lot of Fallen Empires, which Magic the Gathering fans know. I mean, those things, I don't know, are, are they worth the paper they're printed on now? It's been, what, 15 years? Surely they must be worth something by now. Um, <laughs> and a few other things like that. But no, that that'd be it. Um, we were not into board games. Was that? Oh yeah, a, a lot of original Netrunner, not the Fantasy Flight reprint, but the original stuff with the really terrible, um, primitive CGI art because it was done by a bunch of traditional illustrators who didn't know how to do computer art, so they were all learning how to do art to make art for these. Oh my gosh. So yeah, a lot of Netrunner, a lot of Magic the Gathering, and actually a whole bunch of CCGs. I remember I went through a spate where I, oh, is there a new one? I'll buy it. So we got like Xena, the Warrior Princess CCG, <laughs> and a bunch of Star Trek Next Generation CCG, and some Star Wars CCG, a bunch. Uh, Mech Warrior, a whole bunch of them. <laughs> is CCG collectible card game? Uh, collectible card game, yeah, yeah. I can't even imagine how much. All that stuff is stored in an old train freight container uh, on Jen's sister's land in central California, along with, along with a bunch of other stuff that... Yeah, like our photo albums from my childhood and yeah. stuff like that. Because we never expected to stay in Europe that long <laughs> either. Yeah, we thought we'd do three years. Yeah, three or four years. Three Let's years just leave. in Asia somewhere and maybe three years in Australia. Yeah. So anyway... Um, <laughs> that was the original plan. Let's see here. And then last one. It always makes me chuckle at the start of the podcast when you spend 15 seconds introducing it and then put the music on and go do stuff. <laughs> what do you do during that break? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Um, okay, uh, Ian, I'm going to pull back the curtain and reveal the... M I'm going to ruin the mystery and the magic for you. <laughs> I don't actually do anything. Here's the deal. Actually, recording these podcasts... Um, the first thing I do is record this bit with Jen. I haven't actually recorded everything else that's in this podcast. It's just because it's always... The toughest thing about doing the monthly podcast is getting Jen to sit down for an hour. Um, and mostly listen in silence and just look at stuff on her phone or her computer and then occasionally answer questions. And then after that's done, you know, within the next three hours, I just go, and okay, I'll just do my bits. And honestly, there's no reason for me to break it into all these little segments and stuff like that. I I think I did it because when I first started out, I mean, I listen to other podcasts, and other podcasts break these things down into 
individual sections with little musical interludes and stuff like that. And I figured, oh, well, I guess I should do it that way. Who knows? Maybe someday I'll put commercials on. Who knows? Although, obviously, I've never done anything like that. So I just did it because it kind of seemed the standard thing. And then I just kind of started having fun. At first, I was doing um, Muzak, elevator music type stuff. But then I was watching a YouTube video that did a parody of the old theme song for the Rockford Files. I'm like, oh my god, the Rockford Files theme! Um, and so I immediately used that as music, and now I'm just using um, old classic TV jingles from my childhood, because that, that just tickles me. But uh, basically, I do that little intro, and I say, I'll be right back. And maybe if I'm thirsty, I'll get a drink of water. But if not, I just push the button again, and I just keep on recording. Sometimes I'll go to the bathroom or something like that. <laughs> But I, I try to do as little prep as possible. This is all spontaneous, just like the regular show. Um, which, for better or for worse, is what you get with Rado running through things. So, what do I do in that first break? Nothing. I just reach over and push the button and then push it again. Although, watch today, that won't be the case. And I'm making a liar of myself. But we'll see how that goes, because I haven't recorded anything yet. But moving on to Jesper, who wonders... Sometimes, when the board has been set up, it is clear that it will be nearly impossible to win uh, that campaign level. Oh, he's talking about Kepler 3042 solo mode, and which he's finding to be extremely hard. Question is, is it cheating if you reset the board in hopes of getting a more promising starting layout? Of course it's not cheating. Oh, Jesper. It's only cheating if you think it's cheating. You're not cheating anybody but yourself. It's a solo game. You're just playing against the game. The game is not going to complain. The designers are not going to complain. Do whatever you got to do to have fun, buddy. Yep, random is random. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, if, if, it's, if it's blatantly obvious, hey, time is short. You may have to get hit by a bus tomorrow. Do you want to waste your last few hours um, in this life losing? Nah, reset it. Have fun. Um, let's see. But he realizes that he could just keep doing this until he gets the perfect starting layout. Then you might as well just go on ahead and set it up on purpose like that. But on the other hand, why waste an hour losing a game so you can say you did it by the book? Uh, resetting a board could just be considered giving up and trying again, which begs the question, when playing solo, is it even okay to give up? Or is that being a sore loser? Oh, <laughs> Jesper, no. Um, no, 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 no. Jen and I, there have been plenty of times we get halfway through a co-op game, we're like, yeah, mm. th this is going nowhere fast. Let's uh, let's bag it. Um, if you, if you if you feel like you're cheating the game, I suppose yeah, you could say, all right, I'm just gonna re whatever the game is, whatever timer it has built in, or threat clock or whatever. You could just do things as fast as humanly possible, make each round finish in 15 seconds. And, and run through it um, and say, oh, this round I, I have four actions. I choose to do none of them. Upkeep, next round. I choose to do nothing. Upkeep, and pretty soon you'll be dead. You could do that, but why bother? Again, life is too short. You're, you're trying to have fun. Do whatever you think is the most fun. I will not judge you. And if anybody else judges you, that says more about them than it does about you, Jesper, is what I say. I say, have fun. If it, set up the game. Don't worry about if it looks like you're going to win or lose. Look, uh, you know, sit, set up the game. And say, Does it look like it's going to be fun? And if so, play it. If not, don't. And if you get halfway through the game and you're not having fun, do something else or start over. Uh, life is too short not to have fun. IMO. Do you have anything to add to that, Honey Pie? Nothing other than I agree. All righty. Then moving on to Natalie. Natalie wonders how many games currently in the collection after the big calling for the move. Um, I think... I, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it was something like I was close to 400, and now we're down to around 250. It was around 150 games that went to good and needy homes, <laughs> mostly in Malta, and so, uh, some in Belgium, some in Portugal... Uh, Pand <laughs> Apollo made out like a bandit, as you might imagine. Uh, of course, and Apollo gets first dibs on everything, so he got all the really good stuff. And uh, yeah, so I mean, Apollo got a bunch of stuff. There was a guy in Belgium who got some stuff. There was a person in Greece. There were a few other people in Europe who didn't mind paying the ridiculous shipping costs to get some of them. And then, you know, I just put up, you know, God, man, that must have been 50 of them, and maybe 60 of them went that way. And then the remaining. I don't know, 90 or 100 went to people in Malta. There is 
over time, wouldn't you know, um, the board game hobby is getting bigger and bigger all the time in Malta. Just in time for us to leave, we discovered there is actually a game group that meets monthly on Gozo. Not in Malta, on Gozo, the little tiny sub-island we were on. And <laughs> um, so the, the girl who was running that, she ended up taking a few... The University of Malta itself ended up taking a whole bunch of them uh, because they basically they're just trying to have a library because they, you know, they've got a game development program and they want to have a bunch of games on hands that the that the students can use to you know learn game theory or even just to rip them apart and use them for game components and stuff like that. And there's actually a new board game store, the first 100% devoted board game friendly local game store in Malta. Uh, what's it? Malta Geek Paradise. He and uh, he is uh, setting up a library of his own as well, so people can come in and play games. And so he ended up getting a ton of games also. And then there were just a bunch that went to individual people in Malta as well. So they're all gone now, and uh, you know that was a big bunch of uh, hassle in and amongst all the other moving stuff we were having to do. But yeah, down from around four hundred to around two hundred and fifty. Did you ever get a commercial version of the game Thrash and Roll? Uh, and did it make the calling? Yes and yes. That's the... You actually remember it? Just yeah, from the title? the Hard Rock one. Yeah, the Hard Rock yeah. dice game. Yep. Yeah, I mean, hey, if Jen remembers it just from the title, you know that's got to be a keeper. Well, yeah, uh, that that was a really unique game. Yep, yep. So, yes, we did. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the new second edition of it. It seems like that's gone silent. I meant to ask the designer, developer, publisher about it at Essen, but I never ran into him. Uh, but, yeah, we've still got our basic. It definitely made the calling. All righty. When reading rule books, it helps me to read out loud or whisper to myself. It makes me learn easier if I hear the words. Please tell me how to pronounce the whole word for the abbreviations that occur in rule books i e e g oh um do you know what i e and e g are short for they're latin aren't they i think they both are um i have no idea am i reading her question right i'm reading books it makes me a little easier if i hear the words please tell me how to pronounce the whole words for the abbreviations that occur in rule books i e and e g yeah, I honestly don't know. Now I've never even thought about that. You've got me curious now. I know, let's see, I, E, and E, G have different meanings. One of them is short for for example, and then you give an example. And then the other one is something different. Oh, man, now I'm really curious. And this has nothing to do with anything, but folks, you're going to get to listen to us looking it up. E, G is abbreviation for the Latin expression exempli gratia which is for the sake of example. So EG is for example. All righty. And now what is IE? Uh, da, da. Is um, short for Latin id est, which translates to that is. Uh, it is used to introduce a rephrasing or elaboration on something, whereas EG is used to give an example. So you do a lot of ie honey. Do I? You are a super ie -er. I E. And then I just repeat it in a slightly different yes. way. Yes. That's a bad habit. And I apologize to all my <laughs> listeners and viewers for that. And to my wife, too. Uh, as bad as you guys get it, you don't live with it. All righty. <laughs> that was an interesting one. Uh, have you tried the expansion for Above and Below? Uh, Above and Below that came with was available for purchase with the game Near and Far. No. Uh, we haven't. No, we haven't tried it yet. Uh, that's the desert one, I think, right? Do you have your copy of Above and Below? I have not played it all since getting Near and Far. Uh, Above and Below and Near and Far both made the call as well. They were all keepers, and we have played Above and Below with just the base game about halfway through the two-player story line, and then we've played it a couple more times because people would come over and they'd want to play it, so we've, we've actually played Above and Below quite a few times now. Or, I'm sorry, not Above and Below, uh, Near and Far. I was just talking about Near and Far. We played Near and Far... Oh, I think over halfway through the two-player storyline and then several more times on top of that. And we've got all of it, because we love all of it. Love both of them. They were both keepers. All righty. That was it for Nally, until we come back for personal stuff later. David, 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 David says, You've noted multiple times that you prefer games that give you defined goals rather than sandbox games. Do you think this may be due to your inability... 
to play a game more than several times before moving on to the next thing. I found sandbox games really reward multiple, i.e. 10 plus. Oh wait, or is that an EG? No, I think that's an IE. I, I, he didn't say he just said 10 plus plays in order to explore all they have to offer. Hope things are going smoothly. Uh, things are going smoothly now. They weren't for a while, but we're back in smooth town. And uh, I don't know. I don't think that's it's a reflection of that. I mean, I, I, it's it's an interesting observation. It's more an issue with the fact that, well, we only play two player. We only play against each other. And as in Jen's case, especially, to me, in my case, to a certain extent, but in Jen's case, especially, if the game doesn't push you to try a different avenue, Jen never will. She will use the exact same strategy uh, every single time. Well, I'm, I'm bad about that. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and you say, well, well, just don't do it. I mean, no one's holding a gun to your head. Try something new. Try the cow strategy instead of the whiskey strategy or whatever strategies there are in this make-believe Euro game I'm, that's in my head at the moment. And, uh, and, but Jen just won't. She'll just do the same thing over and over again. Um, Although I do sometimes try to just do a different strategy than what you're doing so that we can get a fuller experience. Well, yeah, but that's, b back to David's point, that's more as a reflection of the show. I don't think you would do that if it weren't for the fact that, okay, we're not going to get to play this game much before we actually film it. Yeah. Let's explore as much of it as we can. I yeah. mean, heck, if anything, because of Rado Runs Through, I think we would explore th sandbox games more thoroughly than we would under normal circumstances hmm. because... Yeah, I mean, Jen would probably sublimate her natural inclination to do the exact same thing time and time again because she knows, okay, we're only going to play this a little bit, um, and she knows I need to see as much of it as possible. So if anything, Rado Runs Through um, has the opposite effect on us. Under normal circumstances, though, if they were normal people, and we remember <laughs> back to when we were normal people. Back in the day. Just a few short years ago. Um, yeah, I, I, I know this... I, it, it's why we appreciate Agricola so much, because Jen just can't do that. If if there were not that handful of 20 cards that she then has to whittle down to 14, if she were just handed the same 20 cards every single time she played, she'd go with the same 14, she'd go with the same strategy every single time. Oh, hopefully and just, I wouldn't do it after two or three times. But yeah, No, no I, I, I think you would. Well, I mean, but... I, I, well, that's back to his point, you know, that if we played a game 10 times... Yeah, maybe you wouldn't, but I don't think... Personally, I wouldn't want to have to go through a game ten times before Jen would eventually break out of her rut yeah. and try different things. Well, I mean, that's that's the nice thing about modern board games, is it's not Monopoly, where you always try and do the same thing every time, and, mm -hmm. you know, you have a strategy, it's the winning strategy, you got to do that every time. That's what I like about the modern board games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it's, it's just something we prefer. I mean, we prefer the game... I mean, Agricola is truly the most perfect distillation of this. You sit down at the table. The game gives you a problem to solve. Here's all these tools you have. How are you going to be able to best use them to achieve everything you want to? Um, you know, in the most efficient way possible. And if the game gives us the exact same tools every single time we sit down, it's just not as exciting. And there's the barf at the door. Um, let's see. All right, Jen is going to answer the door where it's... Uh, one of the most wonderful things about being out of Malta in, and back to England, and soon the U.S. is home delivery of just about anything you can imagine. Hooray. So dog food, or barf specifically, is getting delivered for the dogs. But I will continue on. Yeah, that's what it basically comes down to. Uh, yeah, if... Uh, oh, wait, no, it's not. Oh, my gosh, folks. Hey, honey, bring it up. I'm hoping it's a it's not the barf. The barf did not show up. A new game showed up and Do you know what you're talking about with the barf? Uh well it's not game related, so I assume not. Is it from Germany? Yes it is. Oh, it's um Queensdale! Yay! Yay! In German. Everything in German, unfortunately, but apparently they've sent special stickers. It's our next legacy game. It's what we're gonna be playing for the next few weeks, honey pie. Yahoo! I like Yeehaw, legacy. Yes. Um Anyway, folks, uh, yeah, that'll be coming soon. Uh, what's it called? Queensdale something or other from Robinsberger, from the Inca and Marcus brand. I can't even think of it. I just remember it's Queensdale. I want, no, but anyway. So, yeah, there's no choice about it. Uh, a, a, a wonderful sandbox game 
There should be, there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's 100% a reflection of us. For us, it's more fun to sit down at the, at the board in Trois and see, oh, what combination of buildings are there this time? Or in Agricola, what combination of, of improvements do we have access to, as opposed to the exact same thing every time, and then it, the onus is on us to go in a different direction? Yes, we can, but if, if we have a choice between A and B, We'll choose the one we like more. It's it's not a it's not a reflection of uh, sandbox. It's more us. And yeah, I mean, if we were if like back in the day, we had the opportunity to play the same game twenty times over the course of a year or two, maybe that would be lessened. But the thing is, I still think the first three or four times we just keep doing the same thing over and over again. And why do that when we can play a different game that'll give us a different experience every single time right out of the gate? So, good question, though. Jeffrey wonders, what is the best city-state in America for board gamers? Based off stores, conventions, designers from the state, etc. If there isn't a top city or state, maybe a top five? Also, let's see, just for personal curiosity, where would we rank Utah on that list since we're from Utah? Um, uh, we've been to Utah. I think we've what? only drew... We drove through it when we moved from Oregon to Texas. Yeah, and we really thought, um, actually, oh, Salt Lake City was beautiful. Yeah. Wonderful, beautiful. As we drove by. As we drove through, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, so I, I, we can't say anything. I, I'm sorry, uh, Jeffrey, I, I don't think I can Bryce, answer this at all. Bryce anybody? Park, uh, Bryce National Park. Remember how that we drove through Bryce and... Um, oh, the other one that's right there nearby. I mean, I'm sorry, it was like 15 years ago, but yeah. oh, it was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. And does that inform your opinion about if it's best to live there for a board gamer? It doesn't. No. I, I, I have no knowledge whatsoever. I mean, I guess you could say Indianapolis. I, my understanding is Indianapolis, well, one, Gen Con is right there, but... I believe it's kind of one of the central shipping depositories in the United States. So there's a lot of distributors are based in there too, because being based in Indianapolis gives you equal access to everything in America. So maybe Indianapolis, Indiana might make a top five for that reason, for Gen Con proximity, and because you know there's a lot more distributors, retail outlets there. I I don't know if that's true. I've just heard that at one point or another. And geez, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm sure they all have great scenes for different reasons. I mean, obviously, if you're in Florida, you've got Dice Tower Con and all that. If you're in, um, oh gosh, I don't even know where Origin is. What is it, Honey Pie? Oh, uh, Jen is just getting up and checking something. I don't know what. So I'm, I'm sorry. Actually, I am not best suited. This is going to be the kind of question you're best off going to Board Game Geek. In fact, my suggestion, Jeffrey, would be to go to faq.rado.com and then check out number 25, which is my insert other questions here, wherein I suggest here's a good place to go and ask board game questions, specifically the general form on Board Game Geek. I am we've been I haven't been to America for years in any significant length of time. I I I remember thinking, wow, it's really weird. There weren't very many good board game stores I could go to when I was in Los Angeles. But that was like 10 years ago. Same thing for New York. I don't know if any of that's true anymore. I have bad intel. I have bad data for you, Jeffrey. Go ask on Board Game Geek. You have no intel. I have, yes. Practically none. But finally, last game-related question from Jeff, who's in his early 40s and recently started gaming so he to spend time with his wife and occasionally some friends. Podcast YouTube now is amazing. Interesting. <laughs> anyway. All that is to say, now I am mainly trying to find the weight of games uh, we like most. And we are exploring some mechanisms. He liked my next steps list. And have you ever considered doing a next next step list? Or something like, if you like this game, then you should try X. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess I could. That's kind of what I did with my follow-up gateways. Because I said, well, hey, if you liked this gateway, and I tried to pick the most popular gateways out there. Hmm... Yeah, um, I you know I mean I could do that, but really, uh, you know, oh, bah, bah, bah. Jeff, sorry, your your username is Dead Squirrel. I had to scroll down to find his name. Dead, <laughs> Dead Squirrel, Dead Squirrel Jeff, or just Jeff. Really, 
you're gonna be you're gonna get such a good result if you go on to Board Game Geek. There is an entire forum called Recommendations. It was one of the most important steps I realized in my early days of board gaming to try to avoid games we didn't like because I had no idea what we'd like. I had no idea what would be too heavy, and we were just having to try everything. When I eventually discovered the Recommendations form, which is just right next to the General form on Board Game Geek, and I just started asking. I said, "Well, hey, so far we've liked this, this, and this." And and you know there are people who apparently live on that forum. No matter what you ask, you will get dozens of thoughtful, informative responses. Much more so than I could ever give you off the top of my head on Board Game Geek. <laughs> so, or you know, on this. So, I mean, really, I cannot recommend the recommendations thread on Board Game Geek enough. Um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever seen any kind of flaming or any kind of uh, you know antisocial behavior there. It's just nothing but good, friendly folks giving tons of of really good advice. So that's where I would suggest you start, Jeff. And that's it, folks. Not very many game-related questions this month. Let's see. What's the personal uh, folder look like? Even fewer. Oh, my. Yes, this is going to be a short podcast. So, folks, uh, if you don't want to hear any more personal stuff, I'm sorry we already dipped into the personal a little bit there. But um, if you're done, we're done with game-related stuff. So if you'd like to bail now, I would say once again, thanks as always for listening. If you have more game-related questions uh, or personal-related questions, questions at rado.com is the place to go. Otherwise, uh, we'll be back at least one more time. Because we got to do one more to get our year's worth, and then who knows what comes after that. But uh, we'll talk to you next month. Thanks for listening. Have a very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye bye. And hey, folks, you stuck around. Hold on. We'll be right back. And we will really be right back. Oh, I am thirsty. I think I will go get a drink of water. Although, no, actually, I just want to open that box. What's in the box? I know what's in the box. We'll be right back, folks, with some personal questions. Okay, everybody, we're back. Time for the personal Q&A, and I want to get through this stat because Rise to Queensdale is just burning a hole in my brain. I opened it up, and oh, it's so awesome. So it's only available in German right now. It's not going to come out in English until Gen Con, but the publisher contacted me and said, hey, uh, it, w- would you be interested in doing a run-through for it if we send you the German copy and we hand-make English versions of all the legacy stuff. So we have the stickers and everything we need, but apparently we'll have to cut them out with scissors to be able to stick them onto things because we've got this weird quasi real game, quasi prototype. But oh, I'm very excited. Um, but first, the people demand answers to personal questions, starting with Ben, who wants to know, Honey Pie. Yes. Uh, ben knows we both like the Beatles. Yes. But what other music do we enjoy? And are there is there any music slash artists that one of us likes and the other dislikes? Um, uh, that's a good question. I would say you probably like the Rolling Stones a lot more than I do. I think you like Dire Straits a lot more than I do. Dire Straits is my second favorite band after the Beatles. In fact. Uh huh. Um. Basically, anything with a screaming guitar, I don't like. <laughs> so, um, I know when I when we first met, um, my family listened to Neil Diamond. <laughs> so, I would listen to Neil Diamond as a comfort music, and he had to take a while to get used to that. But now I have become fine. accustomed yep. to Mr. Diamond. Yep. It took a bit, but yeah, he's, he's, he's brilliant. It just wasn't my cup of tea. <laughs> um, let's what, see. What else would you say? I... Well, I mean, I, I I think I have a broader range of musical tastes than Jen. I mean, there's there's plenty of metal I like, and there's plenty of country and western I like, and um, I think Jen is probably just a little bit more yeah. smack dab in the middle of pop, probably you know, rock and roll pop type stuff. Uh, so there's probably a lot more I like that she doesn't like. I mean, there's there's lots of hip hop I like. There's I mean, I, I like all kinds of stuff. Um, let's see, but stuff that she likes that I don't. I, I, that was the first thing I thought of was Neil Diamond back in the day, but I like him now just fine too. Uh, let's see here. What do you? No, I, I think I don't think there's anything you like that I don't like. I think what what probably happens is I like listening to the same songs over and over and over and over again because <laughs> I have my favorites. Like she likes using the same strategy over and over and yeah. over again, um, or reading the same book over and over and over again, or watching the same movie over and over again. I don't know how she does it. Well, it's not like I just watch the same movie every night for a year (laughs) but anyway but i will go back and watch a favorite movie Mm -hmm. 
once a year or something. Um, so I think that's probably what you don't like about my music is that I get a Pandora station going and then they yeah. play those songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm always just, maybe she won't notice if I just change the Pandora <laughs> station by two songs over. Nope. <laughs> it's got to be those same 10 songs over and over again. <laughs> right right back to uh, Colby Calais or... Or um, Andy Grammer. or Andy Grammer or whoever it might be. Yeah, yeah but I, I like Jeff. I, 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 let's see. Yeah, I think it's going to be much more like. I mean, I uh, one of my favorite albums, probably my top five albums of all time, is uh, the original Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, you know, the the concept album, and I, I think Jen has watched it, and she's like, "Why? Why do you like this?" And like, I love it so much. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I the, the list. Would be a bit longer than my long hairy arms of stuff that I love that Jen can't stand. I think. I don't know. I just the, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you just probably don't subject me to stuff I don't like, so I I can't. There you. Yeah. Exactly. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. He's Let's, very good that way. Moving on to Ian. Oh wait, no, no. We already did all of Ian's. Uh, moving on to Dan. Question for Jen. Ooh. You have mentioned your crazy hours. In the video game industry in the past, Rado, and songs like I, I Get Knocked Down and Your Car or Getting You Through a Tough Work Period, my wife has a busy job sometimes with very late nights and busy periods. Any advice for a spouse supporting a busy partner while maintaining good mental health? Mm. This is all you, honey pie. Wow. Well, I tried to insist that he come home for dinner at least so that we'd have an hour together because, of course, he would go off at 8 in the morning and not come home till God knows when. Sometimes not at all. He'd sleep on his couch at work. Um, if I was lucky enough to have a couch. <clears throat> well, you were. Not at all the companies. Didn't have a couch in, uh, in Bend. Did I? No, I don't think I did. Well, you slept somewhere in Bend. On the floor. On the floor. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think just trying to be as supportive as possible, be, you know, tr I tried to create nice things for him to eat, special little treats. Occasionally I'd, I'd bring stuff into the office to try and lighten his day. I mean, there's just not a lot that you can do when you can see that they are, you know, up past their eyeballs with work, and there's just, you just got to get through it, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Um, yeah. How did you maintain good mental health? Well, uh, during some of that, anyway, I was playing EverQuest, so that was helpful. <laughs> oh, I did not know that. Well, of course you did. Well, I, I, but no, I didn't, I didn't know that EverQuest was a, a crutch that got you through Siphon Crunch. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I would spend... Uh, basically, you you were working and I was in EverQuest. That couldn't have been on the first, though. The, no. the, the first Siphon Filter, because EverQuest came out after Siphon Filter. So that would have been during Siphon Filter 2's Super Crunch. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because were we, were you... Did you play EverQuest when we lived in Texas? I don't think so. I think no, you were out of it by no, then. I think I was out of it by then, yeah. Yeah. Or maybe not. We were playing something else, some other... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't remember now. So, EverQuest was a big, it was a big <clears throat> lean on me for Siphon 2. But for Siphon 1, I mean, you didn't get knee-deep in Diablo, so... No. I think I just, I had my greenhouse business, I had my graphic design business, I had friends. Mm -hmm. I think I just, you know... You just pretended about. I worked on an oil rig. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. And it was all, the first one was kind of new and exciting and you felt, you know, so enmeshed in it and it was kind of exciting for me for you to be so needed, mm -hmm. you know. It was nice, actually, um, as a, a novelty. <laughs> but it outwore its welcome. Yeah. What about Texas? Um, because, I mean, I, I remember on Pitfall, yeah. it got really, really, Pitfall was, was the one where I didn't leave the building for four days. <sighs> yeah, I don't remember. I mean, you were, oh, that, that's when you were starting to do glass. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that's when you got into what is now your professional career. Yep. So, yeah, so you just probably buried yourself in that as much as I was buried in work. Yep. So that's your recommendation to Daniel? <laughs> Find something you're passionate about yourself and keep yourself sane. Okay. And let's see, question for me. How did I transition from leaving a busy career for early retirement? With great joy. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, when I was a little kid, I'm sure I've mentioned this on podcast before, whenever anybody asked me what did I want to do when I grew up, I always said, oh, I just want to be rich. And they all thought I was making a joke um, about my name. And I'm like, no, no, no. I, I just know that I don't want to work. 
I, I, my whole life, I've known that, I mean, whatever I have to do to be able to retire earlier, let's do that. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we're rich by any stretch of the imagination. Longtime listeners of the podcast know that we, uh, we just live crazy frugally. Although, man, this is going to be a tough year with all this moving stuff. <laughs> yep. We are racking up such big bills. Um, so that's going to be a problem. But, uh, yeah, I know it's... I don't know. What was I talking about retiring in our 20s? Was I talking about in our 30s? I mean, it was. it's always been at the top of my list of things to do um, is, is retire as soon as possible. So when I finally got to do it, it was like, oh, thank God. Finally, punched through to the other side, made it through that tunnel. Um, but then I immediately started doing Rado Runs Through. <laughs> So, uh, I, well, I've certainly slowed down. I just replaced one insane job with another basically full-time job. But certainly a better one since I get to work for myself. So that's an improvement. So, um, no, I mean, I know everybody told me that, well, you're going to go insane. You're such a hard worker. You're so diligent. And, and like, I don't think so. I, I, I'm not a hard worker because I'm a workaholic. I was a hard worker because I just had a real sense of responsibility. That, you know, I, I work hard because this needs to get done. And everybody's relying on me. And that's why I pushed myself so hard. Not because I, I wanted to. I certainly did not want it to. I bitterly resented every second of it, as Jen well knows. Mm. So, no, I mean, it, it was not a hard transition at all. I am, by nature, a very lazy, laid-back guy who wants to do nothing more than just relax. Yeah, all you, the time. You, you you read those stories about, you know, how you have to have a list of all the things you want to do when you retire so that you don't just sit at home staring at the wall or whatever. And I, I am definitely that way. I would yeah. have to have things lined up. But he's perfectly capable of being entertained by the internet and reading books and watching shows mm -hmm. and has no sense of um, Puritan... Work ethic. Worth ethic, worth ethic about that at all, um, which is... Really hard for me. Yeah, a big part of Jen's self-worth is wrapped up in, but what do I do? If I don't do anything, am I worth anything? Like, yes, of course you <laughs> are. You, you need to do nothing more than just, um, you know, please yourself and those in your life. That's your, that, that can be your grandest and greatest calling. And, uh, you know, that's just the way I tend to look at it. I, I, I don't think less of myself for being a lazy daisy. But that's just me. And I'm working on it. <laughs> yeah, you'll be happier when you get there, honey pie. I promise it's awesome <laughs> to not feel obligated to, you know, tick the box of, well, I'm I'm earning it. It's like okay. Uh anyway, let's see. Any advice for someone who is starting a new solo project as as far as time management, like being organized, staying motivated, etc. Ooh, solo projects are hard. I don't I don't know how you do it. I mean, because again, the only thing that keeps me working is the fact that I have obligations, and I take that seriously, no matter how much they'll kill me to fulfill them. If I have no obligations, because it's a solo project, I, I would never get anything done. I, I'm not a self-starter. I mean, I started doing Rado Runs Through with an ulterior motive, and I do it now because it's my job. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if, I mean, I know there are other people out there who are doing it just solely for fun. And, um, you know, it, it, I, don't, I don't think I would stick with it because I, I don't work for fun. So, Honey Pie, yeah. you're the better suited to answer this. What's your recommendation for um, time management, organization, and most importantly, staying motivated on a new solo project where you're not beholden to anybody? That's hard because I make myself beholden to people. Um, that's all part of my worth ethic is, mm -hmm. is having deadlines where I've committed to make something for somebody but some, you know, by some deadline. Um, so mm. that, that keeps me on track. Yes. I see that because it's often a thing. Jen will, you know, she looks at other artists and the work they do and she talks to them and stuff like that. And the number of times Jen has told me, why don't I just work like this other artist who uh, yes. just makes the stuff she wants to make, puts it on Etsy and then eventually sells it. And once it sells, she makes some more. Why can't I do that? Yep. Honey, why can't you do that? I don't know. I feel like I've got to have inventory, one of everything, and just in case somebody wants it, so they get it, get it in a good time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it gets back to what you were just saying, that you, know, I mean, you are creating a need that you could then fulfill. And that need is reliant on the perceived existence of others, of customers, and all that stuff. Yeah. As opposed to, no, no, it's all just 100% internally motivated and driven. I just make it for fun, and if they sell, great. If not, I'll put them in a drawer, and eventually they'll sell. 
Um, whereas Jen, you know, she's constantly about, okay, what are people going to want? And if I do this new line, how am I going to roll it out? Um, and how much do I make ahead of time? And what are my projected sales and yep. all of this stuff? Because I've got to have inventory. I've got to, you know, work the numbers and make sure it's going to work. Yeah. Yeah. It's too, I'm too businessy. I think I need to be more artisty. <laughs> I'm very balanced, but um, yeah. So that it would be something maybe to work towards in our quote retirement. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but that's not what Daniel wants. Daniel wants advice on how to be more organized. Oh, and well, self motivated on his solo project, whatever yeah, it is. You just got to make commitments to people so that you you have. Even oh, that's your suggestion. public commitments. Just, yeah. you know, telling your your mom and your sister and your wife and... Your Find brother. a way to make it not solo is what you're saying. Exactly, yep. Because that's a good be, point. You have to be accountable to somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you do that, yeah, it just changes everything. Yep. That's you a good point. Wanna, you don't want to be embarrassed by letting somebody be down. Yeah, even if it's nothing more than saying, hey, um, you know, if, if you... I'm going to write the great American novel telling your family, okay, I'm going to get this to you in six months and I really need your feedback. And as soon as you do that, oh, I've got a deadline. Yep. Yeah, even if it's a completely self-imposed one, it's yep. just a psychological trick. Yep. That's cool. That's clever. There you go, Daniel. You could write a book about that, honey pie. <laughs> you want to give me more projects? <laughs> Let's see. Rado, I know you said you are happy not in a crowd, but does the day-to-day of RRT ever feel isolating? If so, aside from quality time with Jen, how do you deal with feelings of isolation? I, I'm sorry, it does not compute um, I I was so happy. One of the best things about where we were living in Malta was the total and complete utter isolation. I thrive on isolation. I welcome it and cherish it. Um, so really, you asked me, but I'm going to throw it over to Jen. Honey, how do you deal with the isolation? Because you're much more of a uh, a social butterfly than me. Yeah, I think um, I just am connected with people online and email and Skype. Um, so the physical isolation didn't bother me. Although I am looking forward to um, being back in civilization, and I've I've already got signed up for some classes that I'm going to take and kind of hook back in with the artist community, um, glass wise, mm-hmm. and I'm really excited about that. I think yeah, I, you know I've sort of had a, this sort of five year period of basically isolation, exile, exile, and uh, no, I'm looking forward to being able. I've got a class in what three weeks that I'm going to go up to in Yorkshire. Jen is escaping the phantom zone. Finally. Yep. So, uh, yeah, so that, for me, that's important. Yep. And I think isolation is great because it does make you, you know, work amongst your own ideas. But, no, I'm, I think I'm ready to, I've had, I've had my period, my artistic seclusion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you prefaced it with the aside from QT with Jen. I mean, what aside is there? I mean, that's, that's what I need. That's all I need. Um, I have often wondered, oh, what if Jen died? Oh my God, what would happen? I have no idea what would happen then. As that would really shake me to the core. Um, Because I can can thrive in isolation because I'm not really, because I've got Jen and I've got the pups and that's all I need. Uh, But that's just me. Yeah, but you're also very connected online as well. Uh, Yeah, but that's not real connection. That's not human connection. That's just a bunch of virtual, barely passing acquaintances for the most part. I mean, I I know it's kind of the new normal for social interaction, but it's still different than... Somebody yeah. actually being truly in your life as opposed to being in your online life. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Um, let's see. Oh, and then P.S. Oh, Daniel was another person who got a few games, and he said they arrived in D.C. in one piece. Hooray! The box got shredded, but the games came through fine. Daniel, I hope you enjoy them. You got, you got a bunch of really good ones. Yeah, Daniel, he, he, got, um, he, he got some very good games there that we were sad to see go. I'm glad to know they went to a good house, a good home. A happy home. All righty. <laughs> We've had some of our boxes show up, too, where we're, we shipped them independently. And, yeah, the boxes. I don't know what the post office is doing to those boxes. Well, I mean, well, for the ones we're sending ourselves, I was using the cheaper boxes because I'm not that worried about it. But the stuff I was sending other people, I mean, Daniel. Yeah, I, but he said his box got shredded. Yeah, but, I mean, but it, I probably I did a much better job of packing inside the box, I would think. Probably. I don't remember what I did now. It's all a blur. Yeah. All righty. Natalie is back. She wonders... That's because she met Jen in 2016 in Essen huh. and bought a Rotto cup for coffee. Oh, my goodness. A very limited edition Rotto uh, cup. Super limited edition. Uh, she's been washing it by hand ever since oh. <laughs> uh, be for fear that the printing will wash away in a dishwasher. 
Uh, she met us again in Essen 2017 and, ca- and can't believe she forgot to ask you, honey pie. Is it dishwasher safe? As far as I know. Yeah. As far as I know. I, I, I think so. <laughs> but, uh, there you have it, Natalie. We think so. Yeah, I'm sure you can. They're, they were just, um, you know, mugs printed by, I think it was Vistaprint. Mm-hmm. Um, which is just a company that does like promotional. So should Natalie go to Vistaprint's website yeah, and find Vistaprint. a contact information and ask them? Um, well, I guess we could probably go online and just check real quick if you go to Vistaprint. Vis- Vistaprint. Sure .co.uk. .co.uk. There you go. Yep. Oh. Like, oh no, the barf is here. All right, Natalie. Um, go to Vistaprint.co.uk. Um, and say you've got a mug that they printed and ask them, because I'm sure they have a contact email on here somewhere. And uh, But I mean, I'm, I'm sure it's fine, I imagine. It says here, absolutely guaranteed. But anyway, Jen has gone downstairs to get the barf, and now the dogs, they sense something. They know something is coming. Um, let's see. Moving on from Natalie. She knows that I like The Walking Dead. Have I seen Z Nation? And if so, how did I like it? Haven't seen it. I don't really know anything about it. I, it's not that I have a deep abiding love of zombie fiction in general. I really love the Walking Dead comic book, and that's what got me into the show. Plus, I just love all, pretty much all shows on AMC. I'm halfway through um, Halt and Catch Fire right now, which is so amazing. Oh my God, that show is so brilliant. Um, so I don't know, maybe I'll try Z Nation someday, but it's just really not high on my list of things to see. Uh, um, let's see. Will we be making a video showing our new home in Seattle? Jen just got back. Hey, Honey Pie, we'll be doing a video showing the new home in Seattle. I don't know. Uh, yes, you do. Come on, you know. Uh, Jen said, I don't know. Key emphasis on that was no. I don't know why Jen's being sly about this. We've talked about this, and Jen said, hey, you know what? Unlike, you know, as soon as we did the Malta, the, the, it was the, the advent calendar, um, you know, we actually had people saying, okay, well, I figured out where you were because I, could, I can see on Google Maps you must be on this particular roof and stuff like that. And that's always made Jen a little bit uncomfortable. There have been, it's very rare, but there have been people who have just showed up at our door and say, hi, we're fans of the show. Yeah. And Jen is really was never very comfortable with that. It, it happened. It was all kind of very spontaneous, spur of the moment. But Jen does not want to do that again. So, um, you know, we, we've talked about this. And, yeah, I mean, you've noticed I said we're moving to Seattle, but I have not gotten any more detail than that. And um, while I'm sure you'll see... Well, I mean, I've got, I guess the inside of the house, maybe... I mean, we haven't even figured out how we're going to film, where I'm going to film. It's a, it's a three-bedroom, one bath. One of, one of the rooms going to us, one's going to mom, and the third bedroom is either going to be Jen's new workstation or it's going to be, I'm really kind of keen on this notion of being able to film in there instead of having to film in our living room, which is always such a pain because I'm constantly having to set the cameras up and then put them away and whatnot. So... Uh, if all goes to my plan, all you're going to be seeing in the future is a lot of the inside of that room. <laughs> um, well, it's just good. Yeah, but, but we'll see how that goes. But no, I don't think, the, you know, if, if we end up getting chickens, I don't think there's going to be trips into the backyard to go and visit the chickens. Because, like I said, there are folks out there who, have, who will then triangulate, well, based on this and that and the other thing, this is where you must be. Let's look it up. Okay, it's got to be one of these five things. Let's go find them. Uh, it's weird. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am just a bit of a... I Privacy. Just, yeah, I just yeah. need my... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Not that anybody out there is, you know, malevolent or anything. It's just... Um, I, I never wanted to be famous. Yeah. And the last one, Honey Pie, Henrik once again asked, could you do your Wisdom of the Month? Oh. I didn't give Jen any warning. Can't she come up with one off the top of her head, folks? No. Nope. All righty. Well, she's going to go... Find something for herself. Um, but Henrik, as you point out, uh, Henrik's just now basically got a copy and paste every time you ask me to continue to ask this question. I will do so <laughs> each month until you give up and make it into a regularly scheduled segment of the show. Henrik, this is audience participation at its finest. I will rely on you for now going forward to ensure that okay. we always close with Jen's Wisdom of the Month, which is found... She yep. likes it. This is a good one, and of course, this is very pertinent to my life at this minute. Mm-hmm. If your stuff isn't serving you, it won't be serving you any better packed away in a box. Ah, 
Very true, yeah. yes. So we've gotten rid of a whole bunch of stuff. I would say we got rid of about a third of our stuff mm -hmm. before we packed it all away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And would... Even so, we had too much stuff. Yep, yeah. Leaving Malta. I mean, I, we talked about the games, of course, because people, but we um, we were really leveraging the, oh, it's not free cycle because Malta doesn't have free cycle or Craigslist. I forget what it was. Uh, it was it was a Facebook group. Face Bay. Face Bay, which, um, and we were just trying to get rid of everything. Yep. Um, anything we could. And, and we donated a lot of stuff to um, the, what's it, the... SPCA. The, 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 the Gozo SPCA, uh, because Jen really loves them. And so, you know, basically giving them stuff so that they could sell them at garage sales, or not garage sales, car boot sales, so that, you know, they could make a little bit more cash and run their operation. So, yeah, oh, we dumped a lot of stuff, thing. and it wasn't enough. What? <laughs> and we thought, no, this is really silly, but, you know, I had, I had postage stamps for mailing... Packages out of Malta. Oh right? my God, I forgot all about that. So that had, nightmare. Yeah, so I had about 60 euros worth of, you know, postage stamps in various denominations. Because, and, of course, Jen ships stuff all around the world. Yeah. I mean, so she has a lot of postage on hand, yeah. Yep, and, and so we thought, oh, well, we've got to ship a couple of boxes of stuff to England because, um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be doing the UK Game Expo, mm -hmm. so I need to have some just stuff for that yeah. um, and my inventory and whatever. So I thought, oh, okay, well... So this thing weighs 20 kilos. It's going to be about 80 euros to ship it or whatever. And I have about 60 euros worth of stamps right here. So I'll just put the 60 euros worth of stamps on my box. Mm -hmm. And Duck can take it to the uh, post office. And they have little thermal printers. And he'll just pay the other 20 or whatever. And we'll get a thermal stamp for the rest of it. So he gets there. And this 20 kilo box, or however heavy it was, he lugs it in there. And the lady says, oh, no, you can't use postage stamps to pay for postage. No. What, what kind of a crazy world do you live? Yeah. I mean, this is Malta. Yeah. So, um, yep, we ended up having to cut that box apart, which we'd bought. Yes. We bought it that box. It was a three euro fifty box. I know. So really, and um, we had to soak the postage off of it. And um, I ended up giving the stamps to the SPCA because, of course, they could use it. Um, but basically, you just have to either tape them to an envelope or use paste because the glue, obviously, was gone. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, it was just like you know what. In what world does postage not pay for postage? Malta. Malta. Specifically on parcels that were, if I recall correctly, it was greater than 1.5 kilos. If Jen had sipped all of her little her things individually in tiny little boxes, no she would have been able to use it. Yep. But not as one big gigantic box. Why didn't we think to do that? We still no, because we'd already gotten rid of all our boxes by that point. Yeah. Oh, that would have been a solution. Well. Oh well. Because we, we had enough boxes, so we could we have done that. Tons of tiny boxes. Yeah. So, yeah, that was a big, that was, that was 60 uh, euros worth of postage we gave to the uh, RSPCA. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, yeah, so your closing wisdom, once again, honey, it was a good oh. one. What was it? Oh, As we sit looking up at the ceiling, knowing that directly above it is an attic full of 50 More years stuff. worth of stuff. Yep. If your stuff isn't serving you, it won't be serving you any better packed away in a box. Agreed. And I would also add, packed away in the attic. And that's it, folks. Another month in the can, just as my battery is starting to run very low. No, uh, but I don't care, because i got to go read the rules for Queensdale. Oh, I'm so excited. Yay! <laughs> and uh, otherwise, folks, as always, questions to questions at rotto.com. We'll be back for at least one more. Got to get episode 36 in the can, and then we'll figure out what's next for Rotto Talks Through. And once again, thanks very much for listening. Have a very, very nice day. Talk to you later. So long. Bye. Bye. Bye.